1992, an author called Gary Chapman, he wrote this book, best-selling book, and this book was called The Five Love Languages. How many of you have heard of the five love languages? How many of you have even done a survey of the five love languages? And how many of you, once you realize what is your love language, you couldn't wait to tell your girlfriend or your boyfriend, your husband or wife what it was so that they know how to treat you in love? <laughs> and so the love languages, they say there's five. There's words of affirmation, there's gifts, Receiving of gifts, quality time, <laughs> and touch, <laughs> and sleep. <laughs> and so one of the ones I want to highlight today is physical touch. It's actually a love language. To be physically touched is a love language. And, actually, and, and, in, the, and, and science, in science, they have shown that when you receive a touch, it reduces your stress hormones. And so what happens when someone touches you or gives you a hug or, or shakes your hand? Something called oxytocin. Wow, lucky I have a doctor here. Oxytocin is released into your system and it reduces the stress. So right now, do we want to release some oxytocin in this place? Yeah? So can I have everyone stand and just greet someone, high five them, and if, give them a hug if it's girl, girl, guy, guy, okay? We are Chinese, and, and um, shake their hand. And you're gonna be releasing a lot of oxytocin into the place. Amen, okay. You see what happens when you release oxytocin? You see, there is an atmosphere where it becomes more relaxed. You're no longer feeling stress. And I can tell you that God releases a supernatural oxytocin as well. Another fact I want to give you. In 1988, there was a doctor called Dr. Field. Uh, and she was a, a medical doctor from the University of Miami Medical School. And they did a study. She studied premature babies. What happened was she looked at these premature babies and did an experiment. One set of babies were in an incubator, as they should be. And the other set, they were massaged 15 minutes, three times a day. And what they found is that those that were massaged 15 minutes, three times a day, grew 47% faster than those that were not massaged. And six days earlier, discharging from the hospital. And that is what is so important about this love language called touch. Today, I'm going to talk, we're continuing with the Matthew series. You're thinking, okay, am I going to give you a, a science um, topic, a science talk or is this about the Bible? Yes, it's about the Bible. I'm going to go into Matthew. We continue with the Matthew series. And we're looking at Matthew 9 verses. Okay, let's see. Matthew 9 verses 18 to 24. And the, st uh, okay. and, and the topic for today is one touch of Jesus. The, I'm really excited about Matthew. Reason why is Matthew is a narrative, meaning it's storytelling. And I find every time we go into the Bible and we look at stories, we find so much more in-depth information. Every time we read it again and again, we receive something different. And I believe that as we go through the scripture, I'm someone who likes to go through the whole passage, one, one scripture at a time. And I hope that during that time, not just I will be speaking, but the Holy Spirit will be speaking. Because I always believe your greatest teacher is not the one on the pulpit, but it's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is your teacher. He's your guide. He's your comforter. And He is right here. He is actually not just here. He's living inside of you. 
transforming you from the inside out. Amen. So in this narrative that I'm going to talk about, three people are involved, three persons. Because as in all good stories, there is always main character. And so the first main character I have is the dead girl. Second one, the woman subject to bleeding. And the third, obviously the third, Jesus. Because it's all about Jesus, this book. Everything inside here is about Jesus. So we're going we're gonna to start reading from Matthew 9, 18. Matthew 9, 18 to 19. Today, I hope you can look at the screen because I want to do some uh, discussion, in, interaction here. So here it says, in 18, a synagogue leader came and knelt before him and said, my daughter has just died. Come and put your hand on her and she will live. Jesus got up and went with him and so did his disciples. What I'm going to do, I'll highlight certain key words that I want to just talk a little bit about. Is that okay? So here it's talked about a synagogue leader. In Matthew, it doesn't tell you the name of the synagogue leader. But if you look in Mark 5.22, it says his name is Jairus. That's the name of the synagogue leader. And being a synagogue leader, he would have had a lot of wealth, a lot of connection, a lot of influence. But look what he says. He came and he knelt before Jesus. He knelt before him. And in King James Version, this word knelt is worship. So he ran to him, a Jewish leader coming before God, but coming before Jesus, and he kneels. This guy who had wealth, who had money, who had connection, came and knelt and worshipped Jesus. Why? Well, it tells you in the story. He tells Jesus, my daughter has just died. You see, no matter how much money, how much wealth, how much connection he had, he could not defeat death. He needed someone else to come and help. And he came to Jesus. And he asked Jesus, he said to Jesus, but come and put your hand on her and she will live. He knew Jesus was the answer. Nobody else but Jesus. And sometimes it's only when we come to the end of ourselves, death in this case, of, her, of his daughter, that is the beginning of God, the beginning of faith, the beginning of trusting in someone other than yourself. And so we continue. It's actually the same scripture, in case you're thinking I'm going through a lot of scripture. It is, um, so I'm just highlighting the orange one. And then it says, Jesus got up and went with him. And so did his disciples. This tells you a bit of a nature about Jesus. When we look deeper into the scripture, we find out the nature of Jesus. You know, Jesus is so wanting to help us. He's so wanting us to just say, come and help me in my situation. And he is ready. He's ready to come and help in whatever situation you have. Is there a situation in your life? Finances, family problems, situations with your relationships, work, career. You just have to call on Jesus and he is ready to help. And here he says he went with him and so did his disciples. So we're going on this journey. But as they're going in this journey to Jairus' house, someone else shows up and interrupts that journey. And I call her the woman subject to bleeding. We are going through the Matthew series. In Matthew 9, Verse 20 to 22, there are three verses on this story of the woman subject to bleeding. There is also an account in two other Gospels, the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of Mark, also have an account of this. And if you look at the Gospel of Mark, there are 11 verses on the woman subject to bleeding. So I hope 
you don't mind, I go to Mark instead of Matthew. And that is the beauty of having four Gospels. You get such a fuller picture of the Bible. You get a fuller picture of Jesus. And you see it from different angles. So we're going to look into Mark. Mark 5, 24 to 34. 11 verses on this. Woman subject to blood. So I'm going to read Mark 5, 24 to 29. So we break it down so it's easier to understand. Mark 24 to 29. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. Because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. Here, I want to highlight, first of all, there was a large crowd pressing, following Jesus. They were going to Jairus' house. People are attracted to the presence of God. A large crowd was following Jesus. Jesus had already done many signs, wonders, miracles, and healings. And these people, I wanted to know, who is this? Is it really the Son of God? Is this the Messiah? How come things happen like this? Why, does he, why is he able to calm the storm? And they are joining him. Because they, they, they want to see what's going on. And, and during this time, remember I said there was a woman was there. Here it is. And a woman was there. This woman, there's no name given for this woman. Not in this gospel. But it's also not in the other two gospels. This woman's name, nobody knows. Do you know? If you know, I'll give you a VVIP gift. But I don't know. But what we do know is that she was, she was, sub, she was subject to bleeding. In this situation, her condition became bigger than who she was. Her condition became her identity. And she was just known as the woman subject to bleeding. Have you ever been in situations where your situation, your problem is the only thing you think about and you are consumed by the very problem that you are trying to get rid of? And you lose sight of who you are. You lose sight of who he is and who you are. Because that problem becomes bigger than everything. It becomes your world. And this is what happened to this woman. She was only known as the woman that was subject to bleeding. And when, she, when you are subject to bleeding, you become, you considered unclean. Leviticus is taken from the Old Testament. It's one of the Mosaic laws when it says that when a woman has discharge that continues beyond her period, she will be unclean as long as she has the discharge. And any bed she lies on while discharge continues will be unclean. Anything she sits on will be unclean. Anyone, anyone who touches her will be unclean. So it's like they got a disease. And they'll be considered unclean. Sleeping, sitting, touching her will be unclean. And she didn't have it for just six months or one week. She had it for how long? Twelve years with this problem. I'm sure at the time she had family, she had friends that were with her. She may have even had a spouse, we don't know. Because we only know she's the woman with the issue of blood. We don't know. But 12 years, six months, maybe you can cope with it. A year is stretching it. But 12 years of this condition where she's suffering and she's bleeding and she is sick and she is dying. This is her. 
And what else did they say about her? She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet, instead of getting better, she grew worse. So in the beginning, she, she had money. He's here, it says that she spent all she had. Now she has no money. She went to see a doctors. Doctors. She had hope. She thought, maybe the doctors can heal me. Maybe I can be free from this. But what happened? Instead of the doctors helping her, elevating her pain, it actually got worse. I'm not sure. At one point in those 12 years, she, from, from having hope to now, it was almost hopeless situation. This is what she's going through. A hopeless situation. This story tells us that in human nature, oftentimes we try to find our own solution before we come to God. Here, she tried to find doctors. A lot of times when we go through financial situations, what is the first thing we do? We don't go to Jesus, God, who said he is our provider. Instead, we go and get a loan. We may get another credit card. When we're having marital problems, the first person we go to most of the time is not Jesus. We may even consult a lawyer, consult our friends, and see what options we have. At the time, she had options, but those options disappeared. Sometimes it's good that options disappear because then when you come to the end of yourself, it's the beginning of God. When you come to the end of all your options, God can take over the situation. And what else does it say about her in verse 27? When she heard about Jesus. She heard about Jesus. And this is what I think her heart. She heard Jesus. And then this thought enters her mind, enters her heart. She heard about Jesus. And this thought that she probably had was this. If I just touch if I just touch, if I just touch, she had no hope. If I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. She heard. What did she hear? She probably heard all those stories of maybe the Roman centurion so even being healed. Maybe when he calms the storm. Maybe when he cast out the demon that was called Legion. Maybe when he cleansed the leper. Maybe when he healed Peter's mother-in-law's sickness. Or when he healed many. Maybe she heard these things. And she said, hope may come back into my heart. And it shows you how important is your thoughts. It is your thoughts that is the beginning of faith. Your thought. What are you thinking about? What is your thought life? Is it the things of God? Or is it the things of the world? In your 24 hours, how much time is your thought thinking and connecting to Holy Spirit? And how many time is it looking at the news, looking at what people say, talking gossip. Is that, where is your thought life? Because in the Bible, in Romans, it's very clear. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. A lot of people think transform, the word transform is a very big word. 
Has anyone seen Transformers? From a car become robot. Transformed. Completely changed form to something different. And how, where does it start? In the renewing of your mind. Renew to what? Renew to the truth of the word of God. Renew to him. Renew to understanding who Jesus is. That is renewing of your mind. And you will be transformed. So we read, continue on. She says, if I just touch, just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. And she came up from behind him in the crowd. It's very funny, the word behind him. Most of the time, when you look at the scriptures, when you look at the gospels, Jesus is ministering to people in front of them. He will say, do you want to be well? Do you want to be healed? What do you want to, to those that are sick, even though he knows? But in this case, the woman was behind. This is what I imagine, is that this, they are going somewhere. They're going to Jairus' house. And they probably got a destination to go. They have focus. They are walking fast, brisk walking, knowing where they are supposed to be going to Jairus' house because Jairus' daughter is dead. And we need to go there as soon as possible. And I'm sure as Jesus was approaching, he was, she was not going towards her. And she is suffering with blood, bleeding. She's weak. She is in pain. And she sees Jesus. And as Jesus is with the crowd, she cannot push through the crowd. And Jesus is walking by her. And I'm sure when he says that Jesus, she came from behind, Jesus passed her by. This story gives us hope though. Do you know why? Although Jesus had turned his face away from her. And she was now behind Jesus. she could still go towards Jesus. How many times have we thought that, Jesus, that God or even Jesus is not giving us any favor? Maybe you're thinking, how come that person's getting a promotion? Why is he having a girlfriend? What about me? You feel like, you know what the enemy would then tell you? That God doesn't love you. God is not gonna speak to you. God is not gonna help you. You're better off by yourself but no, this is what happened. And I can tell you without looking at this story that God is not like that. Even if you feel like that, God is not. And this is what happens. She touched his cloak. You know how big this is for her? In many aspects, why it's so big? First of all, in Jewish society, women are not supposed to be in the presence of men. They're not supposed to be in that arena, especially in religious arena or even business arena. They are considered as second-class citizens. She was a woman, first of all, and she was there. Secondly, in an in a even biblical, not, yeah, biblical or religious point of view, she shouldn't be there. Why? Subject of bleeding. She's bleeding. So she is actually an outcast. Remember what I said? If you are bleeding, you, the person is considered unclean. They're not supposed to touch anyone. They're not supposed to sit anywhere where other people sit. They're not supposed to lie anywhere where other people are lying. And they certainly shouldn't be in a public place where there's a big crowd there. But she had the thought, if I just touch. And she didn't care about the social norms. She didn't care about the religious beliefs and, and the way that you're supposed to behave. She knew that her only hope was Jesus. And she went and she touched his cloak. Here it says he touched his cloak. He didn't even, she didn't even touch his hand. In fact, she didn't even introduce herself. She didn't say, like we do when we come for the prayer line, 
What is your name? Hi, my name is, oh yeah, we don't know her name, sorry. My name is whoever it may be. Jesus, can you help help me? Can you heal me? She didn't even do that. She didn't even introduce herself. She didn't even wait for Jesus to say, do you want to be made well? She went and she didn't even touch his body. He touched a piece of clothing that was on this body of Jesus. She was desperate. She was hungry. She knew what she wanted. And actually, I'm, I'm very inspired by my, by my wife. Every time we go for conferences, because we love God. And the more of God we can see, the more I want to see. And every time we go for conferences, when there's an altar call, most of the time, my wife will already be in front. And I'm like, eh? I was going to ask her, do you want to go for the altar call? She's already there. She's one of the most hungry person for God that I've ever met. And it rubs off on me. It says in the Bible, hunger and thirst for righteousness and you will be filled. You will be. That's a promise. And so she touched his cloak. And what happened? Immediately, her bleeding stopped. And she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. Amen. This is our God. Amen. Can I highlight the word immediately? Just because she had the condition for 12 years doesn't mean that God cannot heal her immediately. It takes one touch of God to change your whole situation. Immediately. And she felt her body was, was well again. What happened? What happened next? Did she, after receiving the healing, for wow, I better, I better quit while I'm ahead. Let me, let me go away. She probably thought about that because she, she didn't, Jesus was passing her by already. She should have done a ninja move and just moved away. But let's find out what happened. Remember, we've got 11 verses. I only went through six, yeah, five, six, 11 verses. So we're going to continue to read in Mark 5, 30 to 34. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciple answered, and yet you can ask who touched your clothes? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done this, who has done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembled with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your sufferings. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out of him. Jesus was so aware of heavenly presence that when power left him, he knew. That's Jesus' side. Who was around Jesus? This big crowd, his disciples. They were with him for such a long time. I don't know how long yet at that time, probably a a few months, the disciples. But they couldn't draw that power that the woman drew out of Jesus. The crowd, I'm sure in the crowd there are people who were sick as well. None of them could draw the power that was in Jesus. But this woman touching the helm, the the peace, the, the, actually it was the peace that was touching the ground because she was on the ground already that was on the dust and the dirt she just had to touch that and she was healed it's never about how long you've known Jesus it's about how well you know Jesus and how you see Jesus, how do you see Jesus, is he really your healer, is he really your answer Is he really your Lord and Savior? How do you see him? This woman knew that Jesus was her answer. And only he can heal her. 
And that's why power was drawn from heaven to her. And she was healed. And so Jesus, I love stories. Because I hope when you go back, if you haven't been doing so already, when you read the gospel, imagine the scene. And this is what's happening. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? So basically, Jesus was walking. The woman just touched. Eight power left. Who touched my clothes? He's like this. Who's touched? You would expect his disciples, being good disciples, to say, oh, someone touched your clothes? Let me just find out who. But this is what the disciples said. You see the people crowding against you. His disciple answered, yeah, you can ask who touched me. I sense slight sarcasm there. What do you think? A bit, right? The disciples could only see the physical. Jesus saw the spiritual, the supernatural, the real reality. Because in the Bible it says, the visible is made from the invisible. He was so connected to the spiritual realm, so connected to heavenly places. But the disciples won. And this was one time when Jesus didn't rebuke them. He was a very gracious teacher at this time. This is what he did. But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Basically, he ignored them. Like, oh man, you're just asking such a stupid question. I'm not gonna even going to bother addressing it. I'm, I'm not sure about you guys, but for me, sometimes I ask Jesus some stupid questions and maybe he doesn't answer because of that. <laughs> Let Holy Spirit convict. But Jesus, ignoring them, said, kept looking around to see who had done it. Who touched my clothes? The woman, probably of quite far away, like when my wife goes for the altar call to receive more power, quite far away. Probably quite far away already. And, he, and she realizes, here, he says here, and then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembled with fear, told him the whole truth. Seeing that, she went back into the crowd. And I'm sure there's people there that knew she was the woman subject to bleeding. She went back into the crowd to where Jesus was, knowing that Jesus was looking for her. You know the danger of this. You received a healing without Jesus' permission. You can easily lose that healing. So she was taking a risk. Like, man, I got healed, but now I'm going to have to confess that I took his power and, and like, I got healed just by touching his clothes. And so he went to Jesus went and, and told Jesus the truth. What did Jesus do? Did Jesus say, why you take my power? Did I say you can take my power? Why you make everyone unclean? You touch them everywhere. You know my laws. You cannot touch them. What are you doing? At least say, hi, my name is, oh yeah, we don't know her name, sorry. But no, she fell. And this is what Jesus said. And this gives you a glimpse of the nature of Jesus, of God and Jesus. There's a lot of times we think, especially when we speak to non-Christians, they say, wow, your God is such a harsh God. But this is what he says. And this is beautiful to me. Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. She didn't, he didn't rebuke her. In fact, he did something even better than just healing. He restored her identity. From someone who had an issue subject to bleeding to now a daughter. No longer an orphan. Not just any daughter, but the daughter of the Most High God. The daughter. Amen. Praise God. He restored her. The daughter of the God of all creation. The daughter who wants us 
me and you to call him Heavenly Father. And if some of you may have forgotten your identity, you are children of God. You are sons and daughters of the Most High. You are sons and daughters of God. How do you feel? You know why that feels good? When Tabby said, the kingdom of God is righteousness. You know when you feel right, you feel confident. Your confidence in Christ. You are confident in Christ Jesus to know that you are a child of God and that can never be taken away from you. Amen. Amen. And here it says, go in peace. Some of them, it's not like just a saying, like peace be with you or like when they do in Star Trek or things like this where they say, yeah, yeah, go. You, 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 can, you can take the healing. It says, go in peace. In here, the, the, the actual word is almost like go inside peace and peace surrounds you so that for the rest of your life, you're in a bubble of peace and there's no more suffering. I can tell you when people go through sicknesses and illnesses, the last thing they have is peace. They have stress, they have fears, they don't know what's happening, helplessness, hopelessness. But here he says, go in peace and be freed. You know why freedom is so important? It's linked to daughter. You are children of God. And as children of God, you have freedom. And you have freedom from oppression. You have freedom from depression. You have freedom from negativity, from fears. In fact, I'm going to go a bit more spiritual. You have freedom from demonic forces in this world. Nothing can harm you because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. You have because the son has set you free and you no longer suffer. Okay. Dead girl, how? Yeah, we, we finished. We finished on the, on, the guy, on, the, on the woman. She was healed by Jesus. Her identity restored. Hallelujah. Praise God. Are you not happy for her? How come, where's the, where's the joy for her? You know, 12 years of suffering. She is healed. One thing I like about life, Jen, is that no matter how big or small the healing, we praise God. Because never, ever lose the wonder of His goodness. Never lose the wonder of Him, of God. Because He is God. So dead girl, how? I'm going to go back to Matthew. So Matthew, remember, Matthew series, Matthew 9, 23 to 25. When Jesus entered the synagogue leader's house and saw the noisy crowd and people playing pipes, he said, go away, the girl is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. And after the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand and she got up. Here, let me just paint. The, the scene and what's happening. So Jesus enters the synagogue leader's house, Jairus. Remember, that was his main destination. It wasn't the woman with the issue of blood. But can I say that sometimes you learn more. This is me living some, time, some, some many years already. I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but I lived many years already. That sometimes the greatest learning is not in the destination, but in the journey. Sometimes the greatest learning you get about you and about God and about your circumstance is the journey, the journey you're taking. That is the greatest experience. And here, when Jesus entered the synagogue leader's house and saw the noisy crowd and people playing pipes, so just imagine that the girl is dead. And some, some versions, they say it's funeral music, funeral music. So have you, anyone been to a funeral? You know what it's like. And I find even sometimes in Christian funerals where they go in there and they say, oh, uh, my condolences. Um, and there's this atmosphere. 
there's this atmosphere of almost sadness, mourning, sometimes even hopelessness. Death is in that atmosphere. And this is what Jesus did as he entered into this atmosphere where there were mourners. And the Jews, they had professional mourners who will wail and cry um, because they feel the more wailing and crying, the more, the more you care about the one that just passed. But here, this is what Jesus said. Go away. The girl is not dead but asleep. You know what he did? He went, have, have you ever seen anyone go into uh, someone's wake service or funeral service and go in there and say, hey, go away. The girl's not dead, just asleep. And go inside there. You know why he had to do that? He was taking, that's right, he was taking control of the atmosphere. He took control of the physical atmosphere. And in doing so, he took control of the spiritual atmosphere in that place. And he's saying, when he says, go away, this place is not a place for mourning. There is a time and season for mourning, yes. There is a time and season for things. But today, she's not dead. She's asleep. That is what he is saying. He's taking charge. Were they scared? No. This is what happened. They laughed at him. Can anyone relate? Have you ever spoke to your friend and said, can I pray for you? You know, God can heal you. God can help you with your finances. And what did they do? They laugh. This laugh is mocking. Like, oh, are you crazy? This girl's been dead. I'm here. I see that girl is dead but you're telling me that she's asleep? Are you a doctor? You're not even a doctor. <laughs> and they laugh and they mock. Sometimes being a Christian, you have to stand for things that may seem ridiculous to the world. But are you willing to? Are you willing to stand for those things? When, people, when, 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 when you tell them, just trust God in your circumstances. Pray for your wife. Pray for your husband. It just sounds so ridiculous to the world. Like, what? why would pray help? But to us, we know prayer is not just prayer. Prayer is asking Jesus, asking God to come into the situation. And when God is in the situation, miracles will happen. Because he is a God of miracles. He is the God of the impossible. So things that are possible, you don't need God. But things that are impossible is where God takes over. Let me give an illustration of this. Do you ever pray that you're going to be able to drink a glass of water? No. But there are countries where they don't have clean water. And every day... If they're a Christian, they'll be praying, God, I need clean water and clean food. It is when impossible situations come your way, that is when God can take over. And God wants to take over. Amen. So they laughed. Sometimes being a Christian, you need to be bold. You need to be courageous. In fact, I think all the time. Because that was what God told Joshua when he said, take the promised land. The giants in the land, by the way. But, you know, be courageous and bold and you can get the land. Same for us. Be bold and courageous and win those who are lost out there. Your friends. People who don't know Jesus. Boldness and courage in the truth. Don't make up the truth. Everything you need to know about the truth is in here. But this may not check up to reality for you now. But make this become reality. I always like to say that don't let your experience define this book. But let this book define your future experiences. That's what it's supposed to be. 
Because faith is believing in the things unseen, things that are yet to come, things that are in the future. But you're having faith to believe that it will happen. That is power. That is reliance. That takes humility to know that there is a God that is in control of your life. If you allow him, if condition you allow him. And this is what he did. When they laughed at him, he didn't care. A lot of us will just withdraw. Oh, so when someone laughs at you, oh, okay. He said, no. He's not going to be a thermometer, but a thermostat. You know what that means? Thermostat changes the temperature. Thermometer just reads it. Are you going to be someone who reads the, 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 the environment and say, oh, the environment's like this. I'm going to stick with the environment. Or are you going to go in there and say, this temperature is not right. I'm changing it. Because I know who I am. A child of God, remember? We established that. You are all children of God. And so what he did, after the crowd had been put outside, why did he have to take the crowd outside? I like to use the illustration of a story of a, a pilot who's on this plane. And he's taking cargo. And then he realizes there are rats inside his plane. And they are chewing on vital pieces of equipment, aeronautic equipment. What does he do? In this story, this pilot, he goes into an altitude where the rats cannot survive. He goes higher and higher until the rats pass out. And he saves the plane and the cargo. Sometimes we need to go into a realm that is above the gossip, the world pattern, the things of the world, the things that people are saying, into an atmosphere where it's about God, that he can do it for you, that he will never leave you or forsake you, that he who has a good plan will, will make it come to completion, the plan that he has for you. And you've got to believe that God is your healer. And when you do that, and when you go into an altitude that is not, it is, is that, that rats cannot breathe in, they die. The rats is like faithless atmosphere. This is all about faith. You need to move up out of the faithless atmosphere into the faith, into the truth that is in the word of God. Amen. And he went in and took the girl by the hand and she got up. Wow. He just took the hand and got up. Taking the hand is a serious thing. Just as the same as the woman that was bleeding. When you take the, when you touch a dead person, you become unclean. But instead of being unclean, what does Jesus do? She comes back to life. She makes her whole. She cleans her again. And can I say, God does not work, cold. it's like by accident. God is not a God of accidents. He is a God of destiny and purpose and vision. And here, if we look at another scripture from, because this story is in the other two Gospels. I'm going to look at Mark. In Mark 42, it's quite interesting what he says about this girl that is not found in Matthew. The girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. She was 12 years old. How long did the woman, subject to bleeding? 12. So the day that she was subject to bleeding was the day that the girl was born. And as the girl grew, and probably her condition also grew to a point of death when she was 12, the same thing, the condition of this woman did not get better. 12 years. 
one talks of the older generation and the other 12 year old is the coming generation. Jesus is concerned with the generations. God is a God of all generations. That's why he's the God of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not just the God of Abraham. Doesn't sound complete, right? He's the God of the generation. You know why? Because where there is unity, he commands a blessing. And he wants to unite the generations. Jesus wants to heal the older generation so that they become fruitful. You see, issue of bleeding, cannot have babies, unfruitful. On the other side, this girl, actually she dies. God wants to heal the older generation, but he wants to bring life, resurrection life to the next generation. God cleansed both of them. God made them both whole and clean. And why 12? Some people who, who, who study the, 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 from Hebrew, 12 is divine authority. 12 apostles, 12 disciples, 12 tribe, tribes of Israel. 12 is always about authority. Divine authority, government, governmental authority. And he wants to establish his government on earth. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue. Obviously, the music's there because I'm taking too long. But in Hebrews, I'm going to close soon. Two more scriptures. I already finished Matthew, so, you know, that's out of the way. Hebrews. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. In the Old Testament, the high priest could not be touched. Touched by a woman with the issue of blood or subject to bleeding. Wow, the high priest is also unclean and have to go through ceremonial, ceremonial cleaning. But this high priest, instead of being made unclean, he makes you clean. This high priest... And here it says he can, is not a high priest that cannot be touched. In Hebrews, it's always talking Stand about the Old Testament and the New six. Testament. It's talking about what was the shadow and what is it now? What is it now? This high priest is no longer someone who cannot be touched. He can be touched. And not just that, he can feel your infirmities. How many times we think that we are accepted by God because of what we do or how we are, what kind of person we are. Have we been a good Christian? Have we not sinned? Have we done this? Have we done that? Have we come into church? All those are good. And that should be our overflow. But you see, he doesn't want you to come to him when you're perfect. He wants you to come to him because he knows your infirmities. Infirmities is suffering. Infirmities is sickness. Infirmities are things that are not good. He wants to touch those things. Jairus understood and he introduced Jesus into the story and his daughter was healed. Today, are you willing to introduce Jesus into your story and let him heal you? Let him restore you. Because that's what he wants to do. That's why he's a high priest. That can be touched. And he can heal you of your infirmities. He is here to take away your sin and your death. And give you wholeness again. The government is on his shoulder. We are the body of Christ. We are the church. The government is actually on his church. We hold the keys to this world. The keys of heaven belongs to us. And I'm going to remind you guys, 
those who have done tapas or done some kind of healing workshop would know this one. And these signs will accompany, this is one of my favorite scriptures. And these signs will accompany those who believe in my name, they will cast out demons, they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. God is now using you and me as the connection between heaven and earth for those around us. And he also says that if you are unwell, this is for believers, that you go to your leaders of the church and they will lay hands on you and you will be made well. I believe that unless you are well, you cannot make someone else well. You need to be well inside that you believe in who Jesus is and who you are and who he made you to be.